Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'm going to talk about how to compute a path integral in three-dimensional space. Now, probably a good place to start would be to summarize what we just achieved in Lesson 12. So if you remember from Lesson 12, we basically generalized some ideas from Lesson 8. So in Lesson 8, we learned how to compute the net flow of a vector field across a closed curve. And we had two ways of running that calculation as a consequence of the Gauss-Green theorem. We could either do a path integral along the boundary of our curve or a double integral over the Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'm going to talk about how to compute a path integral in three-dimensional space. Now, probably a good place to start would be to summarize what we just achieved in Lesson 12. So if you remember from Lesson 12, we basically generalized some ideas from Lesson 8. So in Lesson 8, we learned how to compute the net flow of a vector field across a closed curve. And we had two ways of running that calculation as a consequence of the Gauss-Green theorem. We could either do a path integral along the boundary of our curve or a double integral over the interior of our curve. Uh, or the interior region of our curve. And then we lifted this up to three-dimensional space for lesson 12, essentially by adding an extra integral symbol to both sides. Now that's an oversimplification, but in a sense, um, it's kind of like the divergence theorem is a direct analog of the Gauss-Green theorem. It's just that our path integral becomes a surface integral and our double integral of the divergence becomes the triple integral of the divergence. And you could see that formula right here. And like I said, I was oversimplifying there, but in essence, that's what you can think of the divergence theorem as, is a generalization of the Gauss-Green theorem for three-dimensional space. And obviously, you know, we have outer normals and, we have, and uh, our vector field has X, Y, and Z involved. Um, and it's a little bit harder to compute the divergence because now our vector field has three components and we have X, Y, and Z. But in essence, that's what's happening. And that allows us to compute the net flow of a vector field across a closed surface. So now let's talk about lesson 13. So while lesson 12, we wanted to compute the net flow of a vector field across a surface, in lesson 13, uh, we're still going to concentrate on curves. So we're still transitioning to three-dimensional space. Um, but while we're in three-dimensional space, we want to compute the net flow of a vector field along a curve, not a surface, but a curve. And probably a good place to start with this would be to review how we did this in two dimensions for an open curve. How did we compute a path integral to compute the net flow of a vector field along an open curve? So here's the formula that we had uh, back in lesson eight, uh, you know, three equivalent forms for our formula. My favorite one's in the middle right here. Because you could write Mathematica code that emulates this formula. And as long as you tell the computer what x of t and y of t are and what your vector field is, um, you could run that code and you're going to get your computation. So I like computing a path integral as the integral of fields.tangent. Um, but you also see in the textbook, you'll see the integral of m dx plus m dy. Um, instead of having dt as, uh, as your differential, you can have ds, which would be arc length. And then your tangent vector needs to be the unit tangent vector. Um, so all different variations. I really like this one in the middle. Very nice formula for writing code. Now to lift this up to three-dimensional space, we, we really don't have to do a lot of extra work. So the idea of a path integral in three-dimensional space is pretty much identical to the notion of a path integral in two-dimensional space. In fact, when I was creating this slideshow for the first time, I copy-pasted from the previous slide and I just modified a little bit. So um, again, you could do this field.unit.tangent.ds formula where you're integrating with respect to a change in arc length. You just have to add the z on there for the vector field and the unit tangent vectors. Um, again, my favorite formula is going to be the integral of field.tangent. The only modification here is our vector field now has a z of t and our tangent vector has a z prime of t. Or 
Um, a nice compact notation here, the integral of m dx plus n dy plus, now we have p dz. And the same interpretation as in previous chapters. If that integral computes to a positive value, then the net flow of your vector field along your open curve is with the direction of parameterization, with the direction of your tangent vectors. Or if that integral computes to a negative value, then the net flow of your vector field along your curve is against the direction of parameterization or against the direction of your tangent vectors. Notice that we are talking about curves here, which is kind of nice. We don't, it's not super complicated yet. Don't worry, the slides will get more complicated as we go on. But for this first video, we're just talking about how to compute the net flow of a vector field along an open curve in three-dimensional space. No surfaces quite yet. So let's compute an example. So I've plotted a curve for you. I'm showing you a couple uh, red tangent vectors here. And we're going to compute the net flow of our vector field along our open curve where t goes from 0 to 2 pi. Now, here's one way of setting this up, the integral of field.unit tangent ds. Uh, if you're integrating with respect to, respect to arc length, you need a ds here, and then your tangent vectors need to be the unit tangent vectors. We could talk in class about um, how we can turn this into a formula with dt's, but long story short, here's the version of the formula that I want you guys using. We have the integral of field.tangent dt, and it turns out that in the process of changing this from a ds integral into a dt integral, our unit tangent vectors simplify and turn into just regular old tangent vectors, which is convenient from a computational perspective. All right, so our vector field is, let me uh, clear out some ink on this slide just so I can highlight some things more successfully. I'm gonna switch ink colors here. And what I wanna show you is my vector field is negative z comma x comma y. And so when you look at this negative four cosine t comma t comma two t, the way I got that is by saying, okay, I need negative z. So a negative one times four cosine t, and that's how I get this first entry. Then my next entry is x. So let's see my x coordinate from p of t here, my x of t is t, okay. And then finally, I have y here at the end of my vector field. My y value is 2t, hence the 2t that we see there. All right, so that's how we get field of x of t, y of t, z of t. Now in order to get x prime of t, y prime of t, z prime of t, no big deal. The derivative of t with respect to t is one. The derivative of 2t with respect to t is two and the derivative of four cosine t with respect to t is negative four sine t. Now that I have all of those entries, I'm gonna take the dot product, and now I just have a single integral from zero to two pi of negative four cosine t plus two t minus eight t sine t. Crunch some numbers, and I get 16 pi plus four pi squared. Uh, I wanna end this problem with a quick interpretation. So I'm gonna say that the net flow of my vector field um, along my open curve is with the direction of the tangent vectors that are shown in my plot. All right, so pretty straightforward for a path integral and an open curve. Uh, this will get more interesting once we start talking about closed curves and once we start talking about Stokes' theorem. So uh, this is kind of starting us off um, at a basic level, and in the future videos you guys are going to watch, we're going to get to more advanced content pretty quickly.